Ghost lore is to be found in the literature or the oral tradition of practically every existing people. It goes back as far as our records go and emerges from the prehistoric state of man with many of the simple devices and commodities which are known to have developed at a very early period. Today, ghost law is still broadly believed in various strata of society. And while we cannot say that in the 20th century, advanced cultures are especially strong in their conviction about the subject, it remains as a conditioning force in the life of nearly every person. I think we can ask ourselves a question. Supposing that for ten generations an absolutely materialistic culture should dominate mankind, and that for this length of time the entire concept of the supernatural was systematically discredited, and uh, ten generations of young people came into the world convinced that there was no life after death, and that all metaphysical speculation was wrong. Would this end ghosts? Now, this is an interesting question, and I think the answer is distinctly in the negative. For several reasons, the most simple we will consider first. We do have isolated strata today of intellectuals definitely opposed to the idea of the supernatural in its religious or philosophical form. Yet we cannot say that this, these strata, this level of intellect, is free from the machinery by means of which the ghost concept gradually gained control of the human mind. So what do we have? We have a transference. We already have indications of this transference. Man demanding the wonderful and the miraculous, perhaps as an escape from the everyday monotonies of things, will simply develop a new kind of ghost law. The supernatural will be associated with other things. But as in the earlier form, it will nearly always become involved in the morbid. It will contain elements of a new kind of fear. The primitive man feared the unknown. He feared darkness, the elements. He feared the mysterious operations of natural law around him which he could not understand. But fear itself is not dependent upon the unknown. Fear can develop also around things known, but also recognized to be dangerous. In this we have the greatest panic we know, the panic of a cultured people faced with the problem of an electronic world. We also realize that science can develop its own kind of fear. The scientist can fear another scientist. Just as today, with fear and wonderment, with all the anxiety of an ancient tribal primitive, we wonder what is going on behind the iron curtain or the bamboo curtain. And we suspect the worst as we have always suspected the worst. 
We can therefore create a new ghost law around the monsters of Frankenstein which science can bestow. We can begin to think of the ghost of a completely mechanized existence. We can even fear that the machine can turn against man. We begin to recognize how man, a comparatively puny factor in life, plus the greatness of a mechanistic skill, can become the greatest tyrant of all time. So our fears simply change their appearances. But fear nearly always lingers on. Now fears are very much akin to hopes. We use the same machinery in the conjuring of both. But I haven't noticed in any recent years any great outburst of optimism concerning the future or even the unknown with which we struggle today. Nearly always, our subconscious ghost lore runs into the negative. We are not particularly certain that an invasion from Mars would be a group of kindly persons coming to pat us on the head. We suspect they will come to invade. And all the artistry at our command cannot make the unknown appear amiable to us. We associate it always with some negative force, with some anxiety or some mechanism of fear. Thus, those very circumstances uh, which might almost certainly indicate a coming good will be distorted by a great many persons into an immediate peril. It is something about ourselves. And there is something in all ghost lore that tells us about ourselves and gives us a clearer insight into the structure and activity of our own psychic entity. So with some thinking along this line, let us look into it a little further. What is the origin of ghost philosophy? Well, there are several possible answers, and perhaps all of them have a certain measure of truth. First of all, the forthright possibility that there are ghosts, that there are uh, beings from an invisible world that can come to haunt us in this mortal sphere. Nearly all peoples have believed this. And almost every faith or philosophy that has had any concept of survival of consciousness after death has envisioned the possibility of the consciousness of the dead either being concerned with matters in this world or in some way able to bridge the interval between the living and the dead to return and in some way confuse or complicate mortal affairs. So we have this first basic possibility. We must frankly admit that it has never been disproved, but that in various periods our attitudes are of different degrees of sophistication about this kind of a problem. A simple example of our meaning, I think we have mentioned before, but we can fit it in again because it seems to help. Many persons, missionaries, explorers, and adventurers, have left the comfort and security of a rather prosaic New York apartment and have moved into the jungle, the wilderness, or the desert. Here they have mingled for many years with the natives of those parks, and finding most of these natives to be believers in the supernatural, something has happened. One by one, these blasé westerners fall under the spell of the primitive magic. And in the course of a few years, our western-educated 
college graduated, hard-headed intellectuals begin to see spooks. They see them because they live in a world that believes in them. And gradually this influence moves in upon the person. Now if there was no core in man for such an influence, it probably would have little effect. But while this belief in the supernatural has been sleeping or dormant in the sophisticated person, it cannot be said to be dead. Under sufficient temptation and pressure, it will come to life again. And many, many travelers and explorers bring back to our rather disbelieving attention weird and wonderful stories of things that have happened that just shouldn't have happened in the well-regulated universe we think we belong to. Thus this uh, belief, this almost pressureful desire to believe in ghosts and spirits certainly lives on and continues to affect us. Some of our psychologists were of the opinion a few years ago that the trouble originated from the wrong indoctrination of children that the modern child should not be exposed uh, to Grimm's fairy tales or Anderson's fables, that we should not feed the small child with stories of gnomes and sylphs and salamanders, that we should carefully protect their prosaicness from infancy so that they would have no such uh, internal susceptibility to the belief in such things. There was quite a battle not long ago over the probability that Santa Claus was undermining the psychology of the young. That it just wasn't right to deceive children even in this way. Actually, the main trouble seemed to be that folks did not want children to develop pleasant ideas about the unknown. If we had to deceive them, let's show them how morbid and sordid everything is. But we have come to the conclusion that this is true. The truth is to cause the child to believe in nothing. This last, uh, these last two Christmas seasons, some new psychologies have appeared, and several specialists in child psychology have said, let's have Sandy Claus back. It is not as detrimental to the child as an average evening in front of the television. <laughs> if the child must have some kind of imagination training, let's not train it on the untouchables. Let's train it on something beside shooting it out at the crossroads. <laughs> or else we are going to have some other kind of ghost law in which every spirit is member of an organized gang or rides some psychic range with a six-shooter. Thus, uh, it now seems that if we must choose between certain things, it's time to begin to think of creating beautiful imagination rather than to continually support morbid aspects of the subject. Incidentally, in studying ghost law, we then come to the second possibility. Of course, the first is that the ghost is a real entity doing exactly what it appears or seems to be doing. The second is that the ghost is in some way part of the conscience mechanism of man. Studies in ethnology and in ancient social customs and of contemporary customs in other areas seems to, in, seem to indicate that there is some connection between the dominant factors of a culture and its ghost law. Also, uh, even in literature, we observe the great number of ghost stories 
that are of a revengeful type. The spirits appear to haunt the evildoer in one way or another. And so we become more and more interested in what nations and peoples understand by evildoers. And we observe, for example, in this study, that those virtues which a people particularly emphasizes, these virtues do not produce ghosts. But whatever uh, vices a people have endured through the ages and allowed to remain uncorrected, these vices engender ghosts. Now, in one nation, one nation, a certain group of virtues may be regarded as vices. There is no common conformity among human beings as to the exact nature of good and evil. Therefore, there must be conflict in conscience. To uh, one per people, a certain act is virtuous. To another, it is evil. And the ghost tradition follows this human concept. When the individual in a certain culture performs an action disloyal or disobedient to his own culture, he has a bad conscience. And he will very rapidly develop supernatural cults, which will be founded deeply in his own conscience reflexes. If, however, in his civilization that particular vice is not important, but another is, a new set of machinery will be set in motion, and different types of conscience mechanism will produce their psychological consequences. Thus, in a way at least, the ghost seems to be man's recognition of guilt personified. It comes into his consciousness as an avenging force which he believes subjectively he deserves. He has an inward feeling within himself that if he does ill, some kind of evil will come to him. That if he injures another person, that that person will haunt him. Well, we all have this experience every day, but we do not associate it with ghosts anymore. We simply think of it in terms of morality. Even though we're rather narrow-minded, sometimes rather intolerant, perhaps embittered, if we commit a very serious offense against another person, we cannot forget that person. We have created a bond with the victim of our own ill action. We cannot escape from the feeling that this person may sometime, some way, seek to avenge himself, because we believe we would do the same under the same provocation. So we begin to lose sleep. We begin to worry. And most of all, there is something within ourselves, a deep stratum of decency, that we have offended. And we believe sincerely in the mysterious workings of wrong, that a wrong done will lead to further wrong. That when we break the simple rules of gracious relationships, we are endangering something. Now, if we cannot get our adversary off of our minds while we are awake, we are no more fortunate when we are asleep. And we know that nearly all waking phenomena can be continued into sleep phenomena. That the individual in his dreams releases psychological pressure. If this pressure is guilt, if down deep in ourselves we know we have done wrong, this also becomes an element of our dream mechanism. While we are awake, we can rationalize. We can say to the man we cheated, or of the man we cheated, 
Well, perhaps he would have cheated us if he'd had the chance. We merely got there first, and we feel a little smug about the whole thing. But this is a rationalization that does not touch the deep psychic core of man. He knows in himself that two wrongs will not make a right. He realizes in his own uh, depths, nursed by thousands of years of moral and theological teaching, that to do evil is to deprive oneself of the strength of good. So in our sleep, we are more honest than in our waking hours. And in our sleep also, we are able to create a certain visual and auditory phenomena. The individual we have injured seems to rise before us as a person. And this has been uh, reported a number of times, a great number of times, in, case of, in cases of murder. The uh, villain of the piece was so clever and adroit in his per uh, perpetuation of his own secret that it is unlikely he would have ever been caught by the ordinary processes of law. But the majority of criminals finally confess. They confess because they cannot live with themselves. I know at one time when I was working in prisons, I had a long talk with a man waiting execution. He had killed in the heat of hatred. And he said that from that time on, his sleep had never been peaceful. Hundreds of times he had seen his victim and had relived this incident until finally he had confessed. Now, 3,000 years ago, it would have been believed that this revisualization of his crime was a supernatural occurrence. And even today, there are many who would say that if this man saw his victim in sleep, and this victim pointed an accusing finger at his murderer, that in all probabilities the criminal had seen <coughs> a ghost. This is a question, however, which I think requires some thoughtfulness. In all probabilities, the ghost was the memory of the crime something that cannot be separated from the person while he lives. In some nations, this almost invariably leads to suicide. The criminal, to escape the memory of his crime, must destroy his own consciousness. This is the type of thing that we find set forth in the visions of Brutus in Julius Caesar. And even though a crime may be committed theoretically for good cause, still the crime remains an act of violence that is contrary to the psychic integration of the human being. We are not created for crime. It is a false and disordered situation which must result in continuing pressure. Now, in the smaller ways of life where we injure other people, it is noted that we almost immediately develop a desire not to be near those people. The, to, to the degree that we injure them, we dislike them. And more and more, we w wish to be relieved of their presence, for it reminds us of what we have done. The subconscious mind of man can continue to bring back these presences to us. Even if we no longer see the person, we can conjure them in our inner vision. And whenever we do so, the pressure of our own misdeed weighs heavily upon our conscience. Now, in some parts of the world where certain habits or practices which are not good are prevalent, Ghost lore follows almost inevitably in this situation. For instance, in the Orient, where for many centuries the state of woman was far from acceptable, 
She carried and had to bear in silence most of the abuses of the world in which she lived. The uh, suicide rate among Oriental women was very high three or four hundred years ago. And also, the living sensed to a great measure, subconsciously at least, that they were not giving the women of their families and countries fair opportunity. If you go through the legendary lore of these nations, you will find that a heavy majority of their ghosts are women. Because woman becomes the symbol of their own guilt. What they have done, they do not forget. Whereas in another culture where perhaps the general state of woman has greatly improved, or in primitive society where it was originally good, as among the North American Indians, you find no such predominance. It therefore does seem to indicate that there is this strong conscience mechanism. Now, modern psychology, going a little further into this problem of conscience mechanism as a possible source of hallucination, takes into consideration also the narcotic addict and the alcoholic. We are very familiar with the effect of alcohol as a cause of hallucination. We also know that this is true of many so-called narcotic and stimulant drugs. In these cases, the hallucinations are consistently morbid. You seldom, if ever, uh, have an account of an alcoholic with delirium tremens who's having a good time. He is frightened. The experience brings to his subconscious sensory perceptions the most terrible and terrifying visions and impressions. Sometimes things unseen but sensed are the most terrifying of all. So we observe that the alcoholic nearly always develops a pattern. And as alcoholism is closely associated with neurosis, and most of it arises from neurosis, we are not surprised to find the whole neurotic temperament of man released in the form of symbolic visions. These visions may or may not include the true ghost factors, but they would indicate that to these neurotic individuals, the universe of invisibles is filled with monstrous shapes and shadows, of mocking specters, and of terrifying sights and sounds. We might assume, of course, as some ancient peoples did, that alcohol simply releases consciousness into another dimension. But it would be rather difficult to imagine anywhere in, a, in an ordered universe the dimension of existence which the alcoholic experiences. We must assume that it is his own, that it arises as a result of what he is and what he does. And the same would be true of the narcotic addict. Also, we have some experience that indicates that as the pressures of moral circumstance become more intense, that there is a tendency to precipitate them into the objective waking life. A bad conscience, conscience if it gets bad enough, disturbs not only our sleep but our waking hours. Uh, most of you are aware of the primitive principles of the Rasha testing uh, used in a good many psychological uh, tests. Here, actually shapeless and meaningless masses are interpreted by persons uh, suspected of some neurotic tendencies. It is amazing how often these blots and scrawls and scribbles and splashes that are seen as the forms or likenesses of persons we have injured. In other words, we project these forms. 
we also find that we project other forms. An intensely devout person whose life has been comparatively free of destructive forces will see